Hello and welcome to this edition of Community Talks led for by the R for Data Science community. My name is Raul Elogio and I'm going to be walking you through my project, which is an exploratory data analysis on Apple Watch data. So I became introduced to this data by a friend of mine, and I quickly became interested in trying to visualize and understand the, the patterns as it relates to Apple Watch data and just M Health overall because I started doing some research and found companies like a local startup actually here called Evidation Health that does predictive modeling on M Health data and other places that I will, or other research that I found online that I will re, um, link on this repository. So, like I said earlier, my name is Rolo Locchio. I am currently a data analyst at the Hospice of Santa Barbara, and I became introduced to d data science through this organization that my friend co-founded, Jason Freeberg, called Data Science at UCSB. And once I became introduced to data science, I kind of fell in love with it and self-taught myself R and Python to become familiar with data analysis. So this project is mainly going to focus on tidyverse, lubridate, which is also part of the tidyverse, and here reticulate, and reticulate is the package that makes that lets Python run in R, which is pretty cool. I've only recently found out about it and started integrating it into my workflow. And for the presentation, I'm going to be working on an R, in an R markdown file. And I'm going to be using the pack wrap file or folder package to instantiate versions of the packages that will be inside my project. So we're going to be focusing on the tidyverse. And we're going to be using ggplot2 for the data visualizations, which is in chapter three of the book, R for Data Science written by Hadley Wickham, dplyr functions, which are which chapter five covers, and lubridate, which chapter 16 covers in the book. And also we're gonna be using the here package, which is a good way to kind of effectively create workflow that other people can utilize because I was guilty of this too, but I would always set my first R line to be set working directory, which when I had a conversation with Jenny Bryan, she told she recommended using here, which has become super useful, and I've started to include it into a lot of my projects. And the dir the directory of the structure of the directory is inspired heavily inspired and borrowed from Driven Data's cookie cutter data science structure. And you can find more information on the repository, but it's just a way of organizing your repo so that way people understand how the structure is set up. And here's some other stuff. I will include these slides in the repository so you can kind of get a little bit more detail about what's going on. And also kind of just a brief overview. The data, when you download it from the Apple Watch, is exported from an XML file. So then this part, and then I go over in the first part of this project, um, go parsing through that file to get out data that R can talk to with. And I'm only going to be focusing on one aspect of the data collection, which is the active energy burn. And you'll learn a bit more about what I mean by that. But definitely an early iteration of this project. And I would definitely want to incorporate more analysis. And... Like I said, before we begin, the GitHub repository will contain a lot of information and a lot of just things and resources that you'll need for this project. And I'll create, I'll also include an Inertia 7 write-up, which is a website me and my friend co-founded to kind of just create walkthroughs of how to do projects. And if you have any questions or concerns, please just reach out to me on this email. Yeah, and then we'll be ready to begin by showcasing how to extract the data from the XML file. All right, so before we begin the exploratory analysis section of this project, I wanted to sh kind of show people how to extract the data from the original data source and input it into a CSV, which I have to say that I used the Python script, which I found online, which was written by Nicholas Radcliffe. So... Right now we're going to start off in our terminal using RStudio. I tried to integrate RStudio as much as I could. Usually I just actually use a bash terminal, but I'm going to use the one that's located inside RStudio because that's actually really cool. And I only recently started using this. So I'm going to put PWD, which is going to 
do print work directory and we should be inside the parent directory of our entire project which i called apple health data so you can see here the parent directory is apple health data so then this is going to be the main directory where everything inside of it is going to contain all files folders with respect to this project so i'm going to do ls which will list all the available files slash folders inside the directory and you'll be able to see that i've created some folders which include notebooks where i'll put in stuff like r markdown and maybe like if i use python you put your jupyter notebooks there source which contains usually like the source like the r scripts data which contains the data and pack rat which is a folder that gets created by the package package pack rat to create a snapshot of all the packages and the versions that we use so what I'm going to do before we even begin is I'm going to go inside our data directory and then I'm going to do ls. So in here you can see that we have two folders and two files. So the first file we have is the file that is the Python script that will parse through the XML file and will create CSV files for each category that the Apple Health data collects. And then we have this export data reticulate script which is written in R that is basically just like a interface so that we can run the Python script in R using the reticulate package. And then we have processed which is the folder where you usually keep the data once you've tidied it up or like say you're doing a machine learning project where you keep your training and test set and raw where usually you keep your immutable data where the raw data is stored and you don't do anything to that so we're going to go into the raw really quickly to show you that we have two files export.xml and export underscore cda.xml so what we're i'm going to go ahead and go back to the parent directory and then i'm going to open up the source which contains the files and then i'm going to open up the Python script to kind of show like more or less what it looks like and some things that I did to alter it so that it can work for both Pyth as a standalone Python script and in R. So I, you can see here the main function. This is the part that I changed from the original script, which was written, like I said before, Nicholas Radcliffe. So you can see here in the main function, I created a nested try accept block. So this section here, the first chunk contains the code that'll work with respect to the R script. So recall that I said the parent directory is what our project recognizes. Even though the export data file is inside the data folder, for R we have to explicitly tell it to go inside data even though the script is already inside of it, which can seem counterintuitive, but because we're using that workflow, I I'm incorporating it into the Python script and then go into the raw and then grab the export.xml file there. So what I did is I created this try and if it fails then it'll go to this next ch chunk and this chunk is with respect to the Python section of the code. So like I said earlier this file is located inside the data directory so it doesn't need to go into the data like the previous part so it just needs to go into the raw folder and then grab the export file there and then it does all the same um, function calls to parse the XML file and lastly the outer try accept block I printed a message saying that there was something wrong that wasn't accounted for in these two parts which can be something like not actually having the XML file inside these two given paths so it'll just print out a message saying export file not found make sure it's located inside that area and it's called that that would give off a trick that would trigger a warning and then it exit out the script so now that we've seen the Python script we're gonna go ahead and look at the R script so here there's only four lines of code so there's nothing too involved we're gonna be loading up reticulate and here and then the next line of code is we're going to be using the virtual in Python. We're going to be telling Reticulate to use the virtual environments Python. And before we do that, I don't have the virtual environment set up right now because I wanted to create it. So with Python projects, if you're using 
third-party packages, it's often wise or smart to use virtual environments to be able to instantiate which packages you're using and what versions of them you're using. So currently we don't have that. So the only requirements is that you have to download Python 3 and you can download it off of python.org. So I already have it installed in my computer. So if I were to run Python 3, it would load up Python 3 and I would be inside. So then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quit and virtual environments is already installed inside um, Python. So I'm gonna do this command virtual env and then I'm gonna say that it's called venf, which is just a standard way of calling a virtual environment. So this is gonna create a virtual environment inside my parent directory. And once it does that, we can start to use the source script. And from, I know that the, the Python script won't be utilizing any third party packages. Every package that it's using is already in, natively installed in Python. But for future reference, especially if I start to use more Python in this project, I always try to create a virtual environment. So if I press LS, you can see that the virtual environment is in there. So now we're gonna go ahead and switch over to the console and we're going to run this line. Okay, cool. And now we're gonna run this chunk, which is pi run file. So then we're gonna specify that it's inside the data directory and then it's called export data. So then once we run this, it's gonna parse through the XML file and output CSV files that will be also contained inside the raw folder. And this might take a while. So while it loads, I'm gonna, I'll probably fast forward this section. So I'll remove myself and I'll come back when the parsing has been completed. Okay, cool. So now that that script has run, you can see the output that what it did is it went in and collected all the data with respect to each category that is collected and then it opened and wrote the different csv files that capture those categories so then if i go into the terminal and i cd into data and then again i cd into raw you can see here we have all the newly created csv files with the different categories of metadata that the Apple Watch collects. And as I stated earlier that for this project, we're only gonna be focusing on active energy burn, but for future iterations, I would like to integrate all these different categories in the analysis. So since we're not including these into in our analysis, I'm gonna go ahead and remove them. And then if I press LS, it's back to the original files. And if I go back one directory, and then I go into processed, you can see here that we have this one file called data.csv and this is the file that I essentially cleaned up and anonymized that we'll be using for this project. All right. Hello everyone and welcome to the exploratory analysis section of this project and what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be utilizing our markdown file to create this walkthrough while I try to code most of this in real time. And for anything that has to do with respect to like visuals using ggplot, I'll just copy and paste it from a pre-written instance that I did. So the first thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be loading all the appropriate packages into our R environment. And the way I'm going to do this is by calling library. And it's going to be the first thing I'm going to load is tidyverse. Then I'm going to be loading lubridate. And then we're going to be loading here. So then the other thing we're going to be loading is this script called the helper functions, which is located. So I have to use here, here, and that's going to load. That's inside source and it's called helper functions dot R. So what this will do is this will load everything stuff that's inside the helper functions script onto this current working environment and within the markdown. So if we switch over to the helper function, you can see that I have two separate functions. So the documentation I still need to work on, it's kind of like bare minimum right now. But the first 
function that I created was called convert date. And what this does is it takes in a data frame and the name of your column and converts it to a date time, which was important for three of our columns of the data frame. And what we're doing here is this process called tidy evaluation or non-standard evaluation. I'm a little, I don't know too much about this either. I'm kind of learning it as I go along. And this five minute video that Hadley Wickham wrote was really helpful in order for you to understand. But essentially what I'm doing here is I'm in quoting the column name. And since I'm also going to be representing it as a string here, I'm quo naming it and it's going to be called var name. So then what I'm doing is I'm taking in the data frame and op pipe operating it to mutate where the column will be turned into a date time and it'll be represented by this var name, which is the same exact thing as what the column name that we put in initially. And these bang bangs help out with the creating of this function. So this is a way that Hadley Wickham recommends for creating functions. It's a bit more involved than what I'm used to when I first started to create functions in R, but I'm sure it's a great way and a more standard way of creating functions in R. And the second function is called clean data. I'll probably come up with a better name once I publish the repo, but for now this suffices. And it basically takes in the same parameters, so it takes in a data frame and the column name. And for this one, we're only in quoting the column name. And I created this list here. So then this list will become helpful on the second to last step. So what I'm doing with the data frame is I'm mutating it three separate times. And for each of these, I'm essentially creating metadata with respect to the date time that is used in those columns. So for this project, I'm gonna be focusing on the creation date as my column to extract data from anything with respect to dates and what I'm doing here is I'm creating a column called months that extracts months from the creation date and I'm going to use year the year function from Luber date to extract the year and then I'm using w day from Luber date to also extract the weekdays and I'm including label equals true to have it be in a string representation as opposed to integer representation and then finally what i'm doing is i'm taking the months column and i'm converting it to an ordered factor so that the data will come out in this order as opposed to just like if we didn't include this it would kind of come out in a different order in what r would try to instantiate so we want this data to come out from january to december because that's the way we understand it so that's why this step was super ne was necessary and then what we're doing here is just returning the data frame so once this runs we are will essentially have three new columns that will be helpful in our analysis so i'm going to run this chunk and once we run it you can we'll be able to use functions from this and we're going to the next step is we're going to load the data and we're going to do this using read r's csv reader i'm going to do this by saying anon data is read underscore csv and then recall we're using the here function the here package again so it's going to be here here and as previously stated in the past video the data is located inside data and then it's located inside processed and it's called data.csv so then once we have that what i can do is i can just so let's see head we'll preview the data every time we do something so that way it'll be helpful for people to kind of be able to see what's going on under the hood so this will output some information as it relates to like the data frame so it'll tell us kind of the column names and the different structures that they are and then we can just see the preview of the data so then you can see some of the columns that are created initially so it tells you the type of data being collected is the active energy burned the unit is in calories creation date start date end date and then value which is the amount of energy that's being burned for this Okay, cool so now that we have that we're gonna do some data cleanage Oops. and with this section we're gonna be utilizing the 
functions that I created to help us extract metadata. So the way, so then I'm going to do a pipe operation. Actually, I think this might work. So then instead of us reassigning it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this pipe operation and we're going to do convert date. And remember this takes in a date time column. So we're going to be converting it to date time. And then I'm going to be doing this for every one of those date time columns, which are creation date, start date, and end date. And then I'm going to be, finally, I'm going to be using the other function called clean data with respect to the creation date. Cool. So now that that's done, I'm going to put head again to preview the newly formatted data. Awesome. So now we can, if we move to the right, we can see that we've have these newly created um, columns. And so we can see that month, it gives us the month that this instance was re recorded in the year and the weekday. Cool. So then now that we finished with this, there's one more little, uh, one more data cleanage thing that I wanted to do. So as stated earlier, we have both a start and an end date and this is in date time. So I wanted to capture and quantify the difference between the end date and the start date. And I'm going to do this by doing a non data, create the pipe again, and we're going to do mutate. And for this one, I'm going to be creating this column called time diff mins. And I'm going to be converting it to numeric because I found that it can, it, capture this in a format that we don't want. So then we're going to be explicitly changing it to just a numeric representation. And then it, we're, we're giving the end date and the start date. And then we're going to specify the units, which in this case, I want it in minutes. So then again, we're going to preview the data. Once that transformation has been made, let's see, cannot find. I just did that earlier. Okay, so then we do all right, cool. So then if I go all the way to the end again, you can see that we have this new column which is telling us the difference between the end date and the start date in minutes. So the first instance the difference between those two time intervals was an hour, whereas for most of these other ones range between around and gravitate towards one minute. All right, cool. So now that we have a, a lot of the data cleanage, we can start diving into the data. And for this section, I was just going to go over how this data and how much of the data is being collected by month and year. And this will help us look into the data before we begin any type of actual exploratory analysis. So before we start creating some summary statistics, it's good to get an overview of how the data would look like or looks like. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to group by, it's going to be months and then year. And then I'm going to pipe that to summarize. And it's going to be total calorie and then i'm going to just sum up all values with respect to those different groupings and this will work fine but this format is in the format that's considered the wide format and it's helpful but it doesn't really paint a good picture as to how this data is actually distributed across by month and year so what i'm going to do is i'm going to be using a function called spread where I'm going to say the key is equal to year and that's going to essentially make all the years into columns. And then we're saying that value is equal to the total calories. And if there's any missing data, once it creates this new transformation of our data, we're going to go ahead and say none noted if there's anything missing. So then now that we run this, we'll get something that's a little bit more pleasing to the human eye. So you can see that for the month of January in 2016, there wasn't any data collected along with all the way up until October. And if I go, yep. So the data collection didn't start until November of 2016. 
and then ended on March of 2018, which makes sense because that was when I first was given the data set. So just by looking at this, I think the next appropriate step in order for us to be able to kind of come up with good statistical conclusions is I want to subset the data frame to only include 2017 because we're not going to be able to pull out too much meaningful data from 2016 and 2018 just because we don't have it there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this new data frame and I'm going to call it a non data 17. And this is going to be using the pipe operator that will filter and recall we made that year column for only 2017. So now all of our analysis is just going to focus on 2017 because we found that there's not enough data for these other two years for us to like make any sound statistical conclusions. Yeah. Before we move on, I kind of created a visual representation to kind of drive the point home a little bit more. And yeah, so once we output this, this also just paints a clearer picture as to like the data collection. So you can see ends at November or starts in November and ends on t March 2018. And here some initial analysis, we can see that July is missing like it's significantly less amount of calories burned than all these other columns. So that's something good to know, even just like based on our initial exploratory analysis. All right. So we, before we dive into some more into the section relating to just 2017, I kind of wanted to compare and dive a little bit deeper into the date part of our analysis. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create two separate vectors, one that contains all unique instances of dates within our data frame. And then the other one is going to contain all unique instances of dates for just all of 2017. So I'm going to compare those two and see how many dates in our data frame we're missing for 2017. And I'm going to do that by creating the first vector using unique and then converting the creation date to date as opposed to just as, as opposed to date time. And then I'm going to create this sequence that's starts at oops capital D and then it starts at 27 July or January 1st 2017 and then ends on December 31st and we're going to say that it's going to be a sequence and it's going to go by days so once we do this we can put compare to see which values are not inside our data frame by creating this expression. We'll do in AD year AD 17. And then I'm going to print this out so that way we can see how much missing data we have as it relates to the creation date for our data frame. So we have 14 in total. And something that should stand out is we have. 12 that are consecutive days which is kind of should already give off a red flag because we can see that they're all just from december 24 or july 24th to, the, to august 4th so that kind of makes us conclude that data is missing and it's called not at random and this is helpful because it make it tells us that we need to be weary about any conclusions with make we make with respect to July and August because of the fact that we have data that's missing that there's most likely a justifiable reason as to why it's missing. So it could be that this is this falls around summer, so maybe this person left the country and didn't want to take their Apple data with watch with them or it's during the summer so maybe they just had a vacation where they just didn't collect any data or maybe they just there was an extended period of time where this person lost their apple watch and where they weren't able to collect any data whatever the case may be maybe we just have to make sure we're mindful of this when we start going digging deeper into our data so 
we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to go ahead and try to look into the column that is kind of the most important for this data collection which is value and recall that this date this column is the amount of active energy burn for each instance of data collection from the apple watch so what i'm going to do is i'm going to be just use the summary function and i'm only going to use it on the value which is the calories burned so once i do that we get some pretty standard statistics so we can see that the mean is 0.5 whereas we have some maximum values of 11. Another way to look at this is visually, and we can do two different visuals, both box plot and a histogram. But from another initial run that I did of this, I saw that the box plot wasn't too helpful and even the histogram has its limitations. So we're gonna go ahead and create a histogram. And remember, I just, copy pasted most of this from a pre-written script so I can explain some of the logic we're putting in our data frame our x value is going to be value and we're filling in just with a color so for most of this analysis I just chose to use zomp pretty color I'm setting the bins to be 200 theme is minimal and then we're setting this so we can kind of see each tick because if you don't or ggplot on its own doesn't give you the tick marks as as many ticks marks as you kind of want and it would be helpful to look at so i'm just creating the sequence from zero to the max and it's going by intervals of one and then i'm going to remove this part of it because it's not actually by month it's just overall the energy burned so let's go ahead yeah so once i create this you can kind of see that most of the data is distributed between zero and one where there are pretty significant where there's some outliers of we would have to look a little bit deeper to see if there's a lot here because it doesn't really show us anything especially for like we're aware that there's an instance of 11 but just because it's not showing up here this is kind of telling us that it might be like one huge outlier but we can just start exploring that a little bit more later on in this analysis. Um, so I wanted to look over some exploratory analysis. Let me see. So let's see. Let me call this exploratory analysis by time intervals. So before we moved on from this, I kind of wanted to look at about the calories burned into different facets of the data and this will be helpful just to do some analysis that isn't too involved but it'll still give us a lot of good insight so i'm going to start off with weekdays i'm going to be grouping by this and then i'm going to be doing summarize and i'm going to be capturing the average calories burned by weekday by using summarize and then setting it mean to value and I'm going to be including a range in descending order for this so we can see which weekday has on average the most calories burned. Cool so from the output we can see that Wednesday has them on average the most calories burned whereas Sunday is the least on average so that kind of makes sense to me because Sunday is usually like my chill day and we can just keep creating these different little um, slices of the data which is why it was super important to use that helper function mm -hmm. yeah so now we're doing it by month and you can see here that January is the month that this person on average burns the most calories with April coming in second and then there's somewhat of a huge drop from April to May and it makes sense that July is kind of like 10th because of the fact that we're missing so much data from July and so surprisingly September is trailing behind and December is on average the least which makes sense as well to me too because that's usually around the time that holidays it's holiday season so most people usually don't 
go out and actively exercise as much as they probably do in other time frames. And one last slice that I'm going to create is this mutate function that I created or not that I created, but I used so that it captures the week dates as it relates to the month. So then this function ceiling divided by 12 by seven will give us a summary and I can show it really quick by each week dates within that month. So then if it's January 1st through 7th, those are going to get lumped into week date one. And then if it's all the way at the end, so like January 31st, that's most likely going to get lumped into the fifth or fourth week date. And we can see on average for this person, the first week of each month is typically when they burn the most calories. And that's pretty cool. So these are all cool, like little insights to look at that we often can kind of take for granted, but help paint a pretty good picture about the data without being too heavily involved in the statistics or the visuals and whatever else. So that's a good segue into a more involved plot that I created utilizing this earlier methodology here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a calendar heat map where it's going to look into each weekday as the x value and then the y value is going to be each week date which i said earlier was the time the intervals of if it's january 1st it gets put in the first week date if it's the january 31st it'll get put in the fourth or third depending on how many weeks there are and i'm going to be doing this by using geom tile and i was inspired by this through this article that i found online called top I believe 50 gg plot visualizations and yeah i'll include the link in this oops so then here is the link in order to see that so i saw that and it was under um change and then it was let's see oops it wasn't change it was calendar heat map if i remember correctly yeah they had a section called it calendar heat map and then i kind of used that as an inspiration to create this visual here so then i'm using mutate to create that week date column and then i'm going to be group and then i'm grouping by that column and by months and by weekdays and then what i'm doing is i'm summing up all the calories with respect to those groupings and then doing ggplot2 where our x-axis is weekdays, our y-axis is week date, and it's filling by total calories. So then this is going to create a gradient, and we're using geom tile, and we're faster wrapping by month, so that way we can kind of get a good picture of the different months. And I included scale y continuous, because when I first created the visual, it kind of flipped the week date part where... It was starting off with the fifth week going down to fourth, third, second, and first. So then I just wanted to flip that. So the first week date appeared. So then we can just run this entire chunk and you can see, you would be able to see more of what I'm talking about. There it is. Yeah. So you can see the Y column represents the week dates that each of these fall under. And then there's a breakdown of each weekday and we can see the gradient the redder it is that means the more calories that were burned during that day and then the less or the more zomp it is the least calories it burned so what i'm going to do just to make it a little bit more legible is i'm going to add theme and then i'm going to do axis dot text dot x because and then i'm going to do element text and then i'm going to add angle equals 45 and h just equals one so the x-axis is kind of being scrunched up together so it's not really that legible because it's being rendered with inside the r chunk if we were to um, output this as an html file or pdf it would be able to capture what it's doing but for now it's not so i'm going to just add this little segment to make it a little bit more legible for everyone I'm going to run this chunk again just to showcase the newly formatted x-axis text 
and this visual really stood out to me a lot because it showed me just kind of you can see something that almost anybody can read it doesn't take someone that's super tech savvy to be able to interpret and kind of draw conclusions from this plot so you can see most of july's the bottom is missing which we kind of noticed early on august as well and this is something i would definitely want to incorporate into future iterations of say like if i were to create a shiny dashboard this would be a visual that i would kind of want to put at the forefront just because you don't need to be text or data savvy to be able to understand it and that's something that's super powerful in the world of data science if you're able to kind of create a narrative and talk about data in a way that other people can understand that's something a good selling point so now i'm gonna focus on the average energy burned and since i know we since we're dealing with mostly like data that is captured by date for me, it would make sense to try to visualize it through a time series format. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to group by creation date. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert it to just a date as opposed to a date time. So that way all data gets lumped by each specific day. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to summarize and I'm going to call it average cal. And we're going to take the mean of those values summed up by that by those creation dates i'm gonna do ggplot so a lot of this work is just kind of reiterating stuff that i've done before i'm just creating different views of the data and then i'm gonna do y is equal to average calorie and now i'm gonna add the geom which is going to be geom line and i'm gonna make it color equals I'm gonna make it zomp just for continuity and I'm gonna add the smooth so then it helps that'll just help us to see if there's any patterns any trend that we'll be able to pick up with this visual and I'm gonna add the standard error equal to false to not include the standard error bands Cool. So you can see here that there's somewhat of a negative trend. It's not too blatantly obvious. And actually, before I do this, it's, um, I wanted to say, like, find C diff. So these are different concepts that are available in time series. So then see if there's any trend any seasonality so trend just relates to whether there's any like positive or negative trends so do we see the time series or like the amount of average calories going down or going up across our across the across the year and seasonality if there's any patterns that we see whether it be monthly patterns or weekly patterns and also i'm gonna butcher it so i'm gonna look up how to spell heteroscedasticity so if is there any fanning of the data like is there variance changing throughout and if you're not too familiar with and with these we have i have this one time series project that i created with a few of my friends um david campos kim speck and nathan fritter where we kind of did a deep dive in time series and i can link it here and that project became super, it was actually really fun to create and I'll link it so that way we have some of this stuff explained and you can kind of look over and get a more in-depth view of time series. So what I want to do next is I want to do basically more or less the same thing except I'm going to be grouping it by weekday to see if there's any obvious seasonalities by weekday average. So then I'm calling average energy burned by weekday for 2017 and we're going to follow a similar pattern except for this in the group by we're just going to add weekdays and I'm going to remove I don't know why I included years yeah so nothing too majorly different I just added oops, I just added weekdays to the group by so let me change that and then we're adding group so that way it'll create lines 
seven different lines for each different um, weekday. So then let's run this. Okay, so now we're starting to see a bit more seasonality with our data. So you can see, and trend as well, you can see that there's a bit more obvious downward trend in this graph. And we can see that a lot of the weekdays across the months have similar patterns in terms of the average energy burned, except for July. July, for whatever reason, this person went ham on Fridays, which is kind of interesting to note. And it'd be something I'd want to explore a little bit more. And yeah, so we can see that there's a lot of patterns as it relates to just like having seasonal and tr downward trend. I wanted to conclude there because I wanted to show people some next step thoughts that I had for this project because this is no by no way shape or form done and I know this was kind of like the first iteration for me to be able to kind of build on this project and I've included here some kind of next steps that I want to do so obviously I would want to collect more data so I can see more kind of create more narratives across different time intervals so I'd want more than just one year of data so I can so that would be super useful to collect along with collecting from different people so that way I can see like you can compare different people um, and their workout regimens and whatnot um, I would also do want to I need to do I need to do more research as it relates to understanding health data so then I would want to know like oh what is a healthy amount of calories burned daily or something like the relationship between like calories burned and sleep is this person getting enough sleep is this person taking enough exercise throughout their day to be for them to be burning that much calories or maybe like even food intake and i'd also like to create a shiny dashboard where for i want to i guess like what i'm envisioning is like a drop down menu where each different drop down is the different categories of the data that's being collected and a lot of what i did is replicatable for the different categories because the data is structured in a similar fashion so that'd be something that would be super useful and helpful for people and find a way to kind of be able to take other people's data and create a dashboard based off of that something that i think would be super helpful for people who don't necessarily want to go about data analysis but they want to see how their data is making sense and of course machine learning as well because it would help be helpful to kind of just find an application that would benefit people through predictive modeling so maybe i read doing like temporal convolutional neural networks as well as creating relationships with between the different categories and seeing and gaining insight as to how they relate to each other and some other things i would probably just create a sql database to capture all this data because from what i saw is like most of this data is pretty huge so it can be a little bit cumbersome to just keep it inside csv files so then what i would want to do is kind of just take that xml file and make it probably just talk to a database and then just kind of create metadata so that way I can differentiate person to person and include different data structures as well if I collect more data outside of just what the Apple Watch collects. So if you have any questions, concerns, comments, please let me know. I'm all ears and I'm going to be working on this iteratively. So thank you for listening and paying attention. Hope you found something useful out of this.